So uh, last week I did a, a, a you know a segment about uh, the Hindutva, which is the far right uh, Hindu nationalist theocratic wing of of Hinduism that has glommed on to the BJP, the Bharatiya Janata Party, which is the conservative party of India that's currently the ruling party in India. Uh, the prime minister is of that party, and I had kind of you know, I'll say wavering views because I was getting a lot of information from family, from some people there. And, you know, as it was, some people didn't like the didn't like Modi. Other people did. Um, I looked at a lot of his policies and, you know, some of his policies early on or in, in, in like 2014, 2015, when he was coming in, were policies that I would say were an attempt, an attempt to help people, um, such as digital literacy. He wanted to implement digital literacy as part of, um, you know, uh, India's growth. He wanted everybody to have access to the Internet. He wanted everybody to have access to a cell phone. And he said that it was going to be younger women in these villages that are going to be the ones that are going to be leading the charge in educating people on how to be technologically savvy. Cool. Uh, he tried to privatize healthcare. That failed. Um, he admitted it failed and tried to implement a somewhat universal healthcare system. You still have to sign up for it. You still have to, like, you know, again, have access to the internet. Uh, he tried to fight corruption in India by getting rid of some of the larger bills so that there's less money laundering happening. But it's a cash society, and he didn't give enough time for people to get to the city, open up a free checking account so that they can move a bunch of their money into this checking account. Uh, India is an incredibly underbanked country. I mean, America is an underbanked country as well. Like, I, I bet you if you fucking, you know, throw a stone at a globe, wherever you hit, it's fucking underbanked. There's a bunch of people underbanked. And India is no different. Um, there's a lot of underbanked people in India. So a lot of people lost a lot of money, but members of my family lost a shit ton of money because he took two large bills and uh, and demonetized them. And he said these are no longer valid. Right. Like, which is also crazy, like that governments have that ability, you know, that they can just kind of like tomorrow if somebody was like, yep, twenty dollar bills no longer fucking valid. Like how many fucking people across America would be screwed? You know, so. Again, so I looked at those things and I was like, well, it looks like he's trying to help. But then you kind of can constantly you, you look at it even further. You know, he had a he had a big controversy about uh, what happened in Gujarat in 2002, 2001, 2002. Don't quote me on those dates. I can't remember off the top of my head. But he basically like blamed the Muslims uh, which created a uh, for for uh, I think an explosion or something, he, uh, uh, some kind of terror attack, and he blamed the Muslims for it, and then a bunch of people started attacking Muslims. Go figure, right? Like there's all this nationalistic fervor. Oh my God, my country's been attacked. We blame Muslims. Everybody starts attacking Muslims. Gee, I wonder what that sounds like. It sounds like America post 9/11. Oh, it's the it's the Islamic terrorists. Oh, every Muslim is a terrorist now. Burn down mosques, right? That's what that's what the mentality is. You stoke fear. You use nationalism to stoke fear. That's what you get. And so then he had to come out and he, he didn't say anything. But when he was running for prime minister, he apologized to the Muslim community. And the Muslim community was like, OK, we accept your apology. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you are excused um, it, it does not mean that you get to, uh, do this again. It means that now you have to be better to the Muslim community. And now he's not, you know, look at what's happening in Kashmir. It's the most militarized place on earth. They restricted internet. They restricted tourism. They restricted, uh, a, a lot of different things. People in, in Kashmir are suffering. They're under occupation. They want to be their own nation. And India is not letting them do that. Uh, they they never agreed to the plebiscite. They don't they they didn't they never put an interim government in place, uh, and they want demographic control of Kashmir because the, because the Kashmir Valley is very important to a lot of resources to a lot of travel points. Uh, look at the the citizenship bill where they were basically going to try to screw over a bun bunch of uh, Indians that are Muslim. 
So more and more it became evident that, okay, what seemed like somebody trying to do their best was really just somebody covering their tracks to do some heinous shit. Uh, and, and, you know, again, it's like he did a couple of nice things, kind of. He's I'll, I'll put it this way. He said a couple of nice things. He never implemented them. He tried to do something that was good, but then he fucked it up. And part of that is because probably because he's out of touch, you know, and this is a guy that came from the working class. Uh, but the major thing that Modi and the BJP kind of talk about is uh, is being Hindu. They talk about be like Hindu nationalism. Right. That's that's a big part of the of the political sphere in India right now. Is are you Hindu? Or are you not? Uh, you know, after, after the partition, there was a lot of violence, a lot of violence because the country was split. The British decided that India was going to be a Hindu country. The constitution of India says that they're a secular nation. So why are we going along with the, the narratives of the colonizers that India kicked out 70 some odd years ago? Why are we going along with that narrative? Never makes any sense to me. But that is part of the dialogue and the conversation is that it, in order to be a true Indian, uh, you have to be a Hindu. And for, you know, for the diaspora, which is which is overseas, you know, people that are living overseas, I, I would be part of the diaspora because I was born in India and I moved here. So I would be part of the diaspora. Well, part of the diaspora, the the problem ends up becoming that, uh, you know, these Hindu nationalists, the BJP, don't consider us Hindus, don't consider us Indian even, because we are not the, the we, we don't belong to the same faction of Hinduism that they do. Um, you know, and my like my family is Brahmin, but I don't really consider myself one. Because that's a very traditional very conservative kind of way of living and that is not that is not what i uh what i am you know it doesn't match my identity so i stopped believing that's a, and look i grew up in it you know i was steeped in it i did the whole thread ceremony and all that so like i know what the religion is i know what the, what it says i know the tenets the stories the the rituals and all that kind of stuff but the second i stopped believing in it the second according to these folks I am no longer Indian. So what that boils down to is having pride in your country, whether you lived there, whether you were born there, or whether you have some ethnic uh, connection there, uh, and and supporting human rights are not mutually ex exclusive, right? Like you can still be a, a an Indian, uh, not Hindu, and still be critical of India. Again, according to the BJP, according to the Hindutva, according to these these very militant Hindus, no, you can't, right? Like, it's a very strict definition of what Hinduism is, very strict definition of what being truly Indian is. Um, I think that's bullshit. I don't think, I don't think having pride in your country and pride in your faith, uh, whatever your faith might be, and championing human rights are mutually exclusive. You know, it's not one or the other. It's not like just because I'm a citizen uh, of of America and and uh, I'm I'm born in India, I can't criticize either of these countries. And because I'm critical doesn't mean that I don't like these places. You know, I want this country to be better. I want this country to to live up to what it what what it's what it it advertises itself as. That would be awesome. I I want India to do the same thing. But they're not right now. You know, you can't come out and say you're a secular nation, but then say, oh, but if you believe in this religion, this philosophy, this way of life, f go fuck yourself. Like, that's not that doesn't make any any sense. So, they, I mean, so they they claim they claim that you're not right. And and here's the crazy part is there's a lot of violence against against Muslims in India from Hindus. Um you know, and I don't particularly think this is a terrible law based on what the country is, but I can understand uh, they they want to they want to like stop 
anything to do with beef and cow killing and all that sort of stuff. And I, I understand, I understand that, but you can't make that illegal because then you are, then you are, you know, you are making laws based on religion. You can't say, you can't do that and then claim you're a democracy. Again, there's that hypocrisy that we face whenever we see people uh, use religion as a vehicle for nationalism. America is the greatest country in the world. We're the greatest democracy that's ever lived, but we're a Christian nation. If you're not Christian, then you're not American. It's like, hmm. There's no violence in most of these religions, right? Most of these religions don't talk about violence. Um, and if they do, it, it's it's in defending yourself from um, an outside aggressor. The Sikhs are an incredibly peaceful people. Their their philosophy is to help people that need help. Uh, they they are they are people that I've seen go out of the way to help people that need help. That's what they do. Uh, but you know they often get confused for 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 Muslims because of the beard and the turban and all that. Uh, but then you know because they carry a sword and people associate violence with Islam, and so they go, "Oh, you're carrying a sword, so you must be violent." No, no, that sword is for defense. Because within the Sikh philosophy, if if you are attacked, then you have the right to defend yourself. But you, as as a human being, don't have the right to take life one way or the other. That's not that's not something that we can do that according to their. And I agree with that, too. I, I don't think it's up to me to decide to extinguish life of any kind. For, for fuck's sake, I, I had a I had a meltdown because I ran over a possum on the highway. I didn't slow down fast enough and I heard it roll under my car and I kind of freaked out. Uh, I think Ron Placone, I was on the road. I, I opened for Ron Placone. So like, you know, I, I drove and, and he helped cover gas and like we split a bunch of stuff. Uh, but yeah, like I hit a possum and it was Ron and I was dating a girl at that time. And I ran over this possum and we were in the middle of like this really deep conversation and I kind of freaked out. I just don't deal like it's just not a thing that I'm comfortable with. I don't like I believe in that Sikh philosophy. Now, if somebody's aggressing towards me, I do have the right to defend myself. But that doesn't make it violent. That doesn't make it that doesn't make the core tenets of this religion about violence. Same thing with Hinduism. So the people that 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 claim that they're Hindus and they need to exterminate Muslims, yeah, that's not Hinduism, man. That's the, you're also not defending yourself from anything. So I look at that. I look at that law that bans, you know, beef that makes, you know, anything related to to using any aspect of a cow for 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 clothing, food, et cetera, et cetera, illegal. Well, that's a that you're now we're in, in some dangerous waters. I understand why you're doing it. But, you know, Muslim communities don't have that. Muslim communities have a thing with pork so if you make pork illegal then i'm pretty sure a bunch of indians who are not vegetarian which also by the way i'm pretty sure is a part of hinduism or at least that's what that's how i was brought up i was brought up that being a vegetarian was an aspect of being a hindu because you have respect for 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 the you know fauna because animals have a place within our community they help us do certain things right so so you don't eat the the creatures that are helping you do a thing and and you know in some respects it's like plants um we can eat them because they're that's kind of what they're here to do is is to kind of provide nourishment and all that sort of that's hindu so if you're if you're claiming that you're a hindu but you're eating pork yo i don't know how you can do that what well, i mean what i grew up with that those are those are against the rules the problem is that, you know, we is the human interpretation of uh, these spiritual teachers, the sages, the priests, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We take what they teach and we apply it to, you know, to to 
to our personal emotions. And we go, I'm feeling X, Y, Z about this particular thing. What does my religion say? Oh, my religion says this. I'll go do that. I interpret this as, uh, you know, my anger is validated and my my hurt is validated. And through this, through my interpretation of what this sage and priest has said, I'm allowed to go hurt this other person now. The issue that that I think a lot of religions fall into is this is is they feed into this in, uh, and not uh, man, this this gets a little complicated. So I apologize that I'm kind of a little jumpy. But I want I want to try to get this right. And it's it's up here. It's just vocalizing it that sometimes gets difficult. So so let's see if I can do that. What organized religion does, uh, you know, and I'm including extremist viewpoints in this as well. The evangelical Christians, the extremist Muslims, the Hindutva, uh, the Zionists. Yeah. OK. They're all part of organized religion. It gives you something to be a part of. Right. Like you can wear a thing like this is this is I have a I have a little thing of Sai Baba. Um, I like what Sai Baba had to teach. I like what he had to say. I thought he was a pretty cool dude. OK, so that's why I kind of wear, you know, um, and, you know, my my mom likes it. I've, it's also a comfort thing. I've had this on for quite some time. But, um, you know, that's what these organized religions do. They give you the, a, a, a sense of belonging. And they take that sense of belonging um, and through that organization, they exploit it for profit, for 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 ostracization of another group of people. So they exploit it. That's what they do. They love doing it. It's it's the thing that it's the thing that organized religion does best. And how do they exploit it is, again, most of these religions, if you really look at them, if you really read what what they say. Right. The core aspect of it. And I know the Bible has some weird shit. I know the Old Testament has some weird shit. I know the the, the Quran and and the Bhagavad Gita and all of these fucking books have some weird shit in them. Have you met humans? Come on. We have scatolo scatological porn. We do weird things. OK, that's just what we that that's. We, we got the cognitive leap. So we were like, hey, what if I wonder if we can, you know, use a jar for sex? And then we and then we figure it out, right? Like we do weird shit. I get it. I understand. But the core tenets of these religions, though, is not fear. Is not hatred. Is not hey, this person believes something two degrees off of what we believe in. Kill them. That's never. I mean, if you look at it as a way of life, how is that sustainable? And to me, that's what religions are. If you're if you're going to say that you're a religious individual or you're or or you have some kind of spiritual leaning in one way, shape, or form, that is a that is a way of life. You are choosing to live your life in a particular way. I'm agnostic. Uh, you know, I've I've always said curiosity is my religion. I like to learn things. I like to listen to people's perspectives and and try to impart knowledge when I when I have knowledge, right? I live my life that way. If if you're if you're a Hindu and you are and, and your whole fucking central basis for existing is being a Hindu makes you more Indian. And if you're not a Hindu, then you're not Indian. And henceforth, I will eradicate you from my country. I'll eradicate you from my culture. You're not Hindu, man. That's not what Hinduism is about. Nowhere in these books does it say if they don't belong to your religion, then you should go kill them. That is a manufactured interpretation of these of, of these teachings used for power and wealth. That's it. Organized religion is the problem. So here's here's some things that should be organized, right? I'm not shitting on organization. Here's some things that we can we 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 I think should be organized. Workers. 
uh, files, documents, socks, organize your socks, you know? That's important. Sometimes I've done it. I've I've not organized my socks, and then I got long sock on one side, ankle socks on the other. It just gets weird. It's uncomfortable. Weed, weed should be organized. You should know. You should know what your indicas are, what your sativas are, what your hybrids are, what your sativa dominant hybrids are, what your indica dominant uh, hybrids are. Dosages and how they affect your body. Organize that shit. Get a spreadsheet going. I got to do that. I got a spreadsheet in in that little thing back there that I got to run through and write down, you know, hey, this is th this weed and is this kind of thing. And this is how it makes me feel. And this is what it's good for. Yada, yada, yada. Organize that shit. Things that should not be organized. Religion. End of list. Don't organize your religion. Why? Because it separates it from becoming a way of life. It separates it uh, from from the teaching. And and then and then you're and then you're in a clubhouse and clubhouses have rules and agendas and certain people aren't allowed. It creates uh, uh, feelings of resentment, feelings of 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 isolation. You know, don't organize that shit. Let it be a little bit more free form. Right. Like you can let people let people's uh, philosophies evolve a little bit more. You gotta let you gotta let people evolve, and and I think once you organize religion and put it within a box, you're not letting people evolve. You're keeping people within a certain point of tradition, and you're keeping people within a certain point of of definition. So when the Hindutva comes out and says, "Well, if you're not Hindu, then you're not truly Indian," well, that's a whole load of crock of shit. So the question then becomes, is it necessary for you to be a Hindu in order to be truly Indian? And according to 64% uh, of Indian adults in 2019, uh, they said that, uh, I haven't known it down wrong, but they said, yes, you, they they feel like their, their Indianness, if you will, is very much connected to being Hindu. Um, I disagree with that because being Indian is not about a religion. That is a part of the world that you are from. It, 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 there's aspects of culture and there's a history and all the stuff that that comes with being a Hindu. And that's in your blood. That's in your DNA. Religion really doesn't have anything to do. It can be a part of it, but it's not the defining factor of it. Uh, the Pew Research, the same Pew Research that found that 64% of Indian adults said that it you know in order for them to feel like they're hindu or, or truly indian they they need to be hindu uh that same research found that uh people said respecting other religions is just as crucial to being truly hindu so how can that be so how can the hindutva come out and say that they're truly indian because they are the most hindu of all hindus and if it's also true that it's crucial for you to respect other people's religion in order to be Indian, but then at the same time you're disparaging Muslims and in some instances Christians and Catholics that live in that country too and treat them as secondhand citizens, how can you truly be Indian at that point? Some discrepancies in that situation. It's it's the same thing as as saying you're not truly American unless you believe in the Bible. You're not truly, uh, you know, uh, a, a Jew. Well, I guess for, for, in terms of Israel, it's like you're not really a Jew unless you believe in Israel. Like that's just a whole other fucking clusterfuck of things that I've talked about several times. Um, but yeah, I, you know, as somebody that lives here, I've heard that a lot from Indian people. Uh the stand-up clip that you saw, which on my album Politely Angry is track two or three or something, um, that bit, you know, either Indian people loved or hated. I'm not trying to make fun of India. I'm accurately dis de trying to depict what India is like and juxtaposing it to what it's like here. You know, there there's more vibrancy in that country. People don't get offended if you talk to them on the streets or something like that. It's crowded. There's movement all the time. Like there's. America's kind of static. We're, we're a very private, individualistic country.
We value that. Look, I, and I value certain things to be private as well, but it's to a different. So that's what. I, but Indian people, there are certain Indian people. There was one Indian guy that got really, really fucking mad. I wrote about it, and this guy was a lefty. You know, had Spock on his fucking banner and was all about BLM and stuff, and basically said, "I'm just as bad as Russell Peters and his racist bullshit." Um, I'm disparaging Indians. I'm setting Indians back. Uh, at least Russell Peters is funny, which is like, what? There's so many hypocrisies in that statement, too. But other Indians have claimed that I'm not Indian because I grew up here and I, I'm not Hindu anymore. So, you know, talking about this stuff is kind of important because I can't be the only one that feels that way. All right. I'm going to look at your comments. Ba -bum. <laughs> Fred, Fred says, I <laughs> don't we all? Uh, Holly's uh, Holly asks a good question. What kind of support does Modi have generally? Oh, I he's he's got a lot of support in India, actually. Um, the, the it's it's not like 80 percent of the people, but I think there is a decent majority support of him and the policies. Uh, even even uh, Indians here really support him. What I mean, what you really got to realize about a lot of Indians here is that a lot of Indians here, especially first generation Indians that came here in, you know, the, the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, even even going so far as the, the 70s, um, you know, they they came here in the pursuit of of a better life and wealth and all that sort of stuff. So they are actually pretty Republican when it comes to their support. They're very conservative when it comes to their support. So they look at someone like Modi and they go, yeah, this guy's doing what we want. He's upholding the Brahmins. He's upholding the upper castes of India. He is really bringing Hinduism back to the to the glory that it was. I mean, it's it's kind of the same mentality as the MAGA folks. Right. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Zozovix, good to see you. Thank you for joining. Uh, but, but, but every time somebody leaves a comment, it just scrolls to the bottom. So I missed the earlier comments. Uh, Diaspora, euphemism for spermatogenesis, uh, except what, what was that? Except on Earth. I don't know if I fully understand that statement. <laughs> Uh, Zosvik says, I don't even like dressing up t-shirts and shorts. Good enough for me. No jewelry, not even a watch. I'm very selective about my jewelry, but I do, I will say this. I miss, I wish I do miss wearing my watch. Uh, lost, lost the watch in, uh, in the divorce somewhere, uh, which is unfortunate because it was a pretty dope watch. Uh, but I do miss wearing a watch. I like, I like having a watch. Uh, rings I'm pretty ambivalent on. I don't really care. This, the, the this I've had on for quite some time. And like I said, you know, my mom believes in Hinduism pretty regularly, uh, pretty heavily, I should say. So, you know, this is something that that's kind of important for her. And, you know, I, I, at this point, I've just had something around my neck for so damn long. It, it, it's it's like uh, it's it's like a part of me at this point, you know, like I need to have it on. Um Hamza. Hamza points out that Alex Jones is going to join Rockfin next week. Oh man, that's gonna be interesting. That's really that's gonna that's gonna be kind of weird. Uh Zuzvik says, I don't like how it feels. It's it's like it just oh, I totally get that. Yeah, I I like I have earrings and they have to be pretty small in order for me to uh um to to wear them. I don't like big gaudy jewelry. Uh that stuff bothers me a whole lot. Uh even even like the wedding band that I got was like a simple, it's just gotta be real simple. I, I like minimalist stuff. So yeah, I don't, I, I don't like wearing too much jewelry. Uh, Zosvix also says Sam Harris and his map of the world and where you live and how that determines your religion. Like 99% of the time is a very good map to show people when they are lost in religion and the worser aspects of it. That's interesting. I'll have to check that out. Uh, I'm not a huge Sam Harris guy. Um, yeah, I'm not a huge Sam Harris guy, but I will have to check that out. That does sound, uh, that does sound interesting. 
Fred says the Bible exists. I don't believe it, it, it is direct for, for uh, from God verbatim. I, I don't I don't think so either. I, I think, you know, there there needed to be a way to find some order and some kind of chaos. And so here we are. We have some religious texts. Uh, you know, I think there's a good chance that Jesus was a real dude that walked around and preached some shit. And said some things that uh, were controversial that, you know, the uh, uh, the heads of these religious institutions didn't particularly care for. Uh, he also wasn't a big fan of bankers. And that was kind of the tip off for 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 him to be crucified. So. Um, uh, criticism of Tulsi for being pro Modi and anti Muslim. Yeah, that was something I talked about. Uh, so. The research I did, I talked about it in 2019, the research I did and the Glenn Greenwald interview with her, her, from what it looks like, her parents have a direct connection to Modi. I don't know how much of a connection she has to Modi other than that proxy. Um, I don't know if she's anti-Muslim, though. It would be, again, it would kind of be really odd. It would be like the Title IX thing. Uh, if she came out and said some anti-Muslim stuff, I believe that it would be very odd uh, for her to say that because she is so much like, uh, you know, hey, we ha we have to embrace other religions. We have to learn from them. We have to, you know, accept each other for our differences. So if if she has said anything anti-Muslim, I'm not I'm not aware of it. Um you know, uh, but if, if you if you have a clip or something like that, uh, you know, please do let me know. And uh, and I will I will look into that because that is uh, that'd be kind of fucked up. That'd be kind of fucked up. Uh, it, yeah, it, it would it would definitely throw me for a loop. Uh, Zuzvik says, saw you on Slow News Day. Yeah, I've I've started co-hosting on Action for Assange. Um Every every other Tuesday, I will be co-hosting with them, which is very exciting. Uh, Shane asks a question. Do you follow Vandana Shiva? She's another one of my favorite Indian people. Yes, I do. She's fantastic. Uh, she's actually a wealth of knowledge. When I did my... Uh, I, I did a video on why organic food is so expensive um, and went into some of the stuff that Monsanto was doing and how Monsanto was affecting India. Uh, she's a wealth of knowledge when it comes to that sort of stuff. So if you haven't, if you guys haven't checked out Dr. Vandana Shiva, uh, I would very much recommend uh, you check check that out. She has a great interview from a few years ago that my friend Rolf uh, pointed me out to on uh, on Chris Hedges' program called On Contact. Uh, excellent interview, really in depth stuff. Uh, plus, it's Hedges, so you know uh, it, you you know it's it's going to be good. It's going to be highly informative and it's going to be bleak as fuck because <laughs> that's what Hedges does, man. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this video. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure you hit the like button and please make sure you share this content out. Sharing is very important. Sharing is how independent media gets the word out there about topics that corporate media doesn't even want to mention on their networks. So it's really up to you guys. Corporate media very much depends on the people. We are people-powered media. That's what we really are. Uh, another great way to help if you're on stable financial ground is to uh, make a financial contribution to this channel. And you can do so over at krishmohanhaha.com slash donate. You can become a sustaining member, which gets you free tickets, early access to videos, bonus stand-up comedy and storytelling content, uh, a way for you to communicate directly with me, ask me questions, and other uh, premium content that uh, will be released on a monthly basis. Um, or you can make a one-time donation as well on that same website. Um, I also have uh, various stand-up comedy albums. I have about six comedy albums out right now uh, that are available on my website at krishmohanhaha.com. And most of them, if you get them off of Bandcamp, are available for a dollar or a, a pay-what-you-want pricing. And I also want to mention that I do have an online merch store. Uh, you can go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com, click on the merch tab, and check out all of the designs that I've made myself. And the Julian Assange shirt, there is a Julian Assange shirt that's on the website. All the profit from the Julian Assange designs will be going to uh, pro-Assange activists, such as Action for Assange, uh, Kevin Gostola, Richard Methurst, 
folks uh, 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 that, that are covering and talking about Assange. So I'm going to be making donations to them. Um, uh, it'll be 100% of the profits I make off of that shirt. Uh, thank you again for tuning in. Thank you again to all the people that have made contributions to the show, that regularly check out my content, that have subscribed to my channels. I, I very, very much appreciate it, and uh, and you guys help keep this uh, keep keep this this train a moving. So I, I very much appreciate that. Until the next video, we'll see you on the road. See you guys.